live everyone <laughs> make sure that what you say uh, you know you don't say anything too private <laughs> um, so I will start I just need to put up my presentation uh, I will be reading uh, from my phone so welcome Elias I hope you can hear us by the way is the quality good yes I'm listening Romina. Lovely. yeah it is good thank you for joining us <laughs> okay so welcome. Uh, welcome everyone online um thank you for joining us for the launch of the colonial subversions we're very excited uh first and foremost we keep we hope that you're all keeping safe uh, and healthy in in these unprecedented unprecedented times really that we're living in. uh we understand that most of you are in some sort of lockdown uh, or other measures that are being taken so we hope that you are adapting and that your loved ones and communities are safe and healthy. Um, some logistical stuff first. Uh, for today's event, we will be using a combination of video conferencing, so Zoom video conferencing with some up to uh, webcasting technology. This is a first for us. It's an experiment, so we're trying to transition online. Uh, so bear with us if the connection becomes slow. Uh, do wait until we reconnect. And uh, both Monica and I are live streaming from our laptop. So if my, my live stream goes wrong, then we can switch later on. Um, you can, you're welcome to post comments, thoughts, uh, and questions for us uh, on Twitter. We have a Twitter account at uh, lower-decolonize with S, British spelling, uh, with an, or under the hashtag uh, decolonize. Um, we probably won't have the time to take these questions during the session because we have quite a, a packed schedule for today and we would like to spend more time, um, give more time to our partners to speak. So we will try to address those questions uh, later on on Twitter through our account. And to my knowledge, most of our partners have Twitter accounts so they can address those questions directly. Um, I have already connected, as I said, with Monica, the co-founder co of Decolonial Subversions on the other side. Um, and Elias Gobrselassi, who is in Ethiopia, who is one of our team members and will join us later in the discussion. Um, I will, will, let's, we'll first introduce ourselves and then we'll move to uh, the program for today. So my name is uh, Romina Strati. I currently uh, work temporarily as Senior Teaching Fellow at SOAS, University of London. Uh, my own research lies at the intersection of gender development and religions from a decolonial perspective and it's informed by about now a decade's uh, experience working in community-based gender and development in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also by my own personal positionality as an Eastern European. Um, I joined academia about um, now five years ago uh, to pursue a PhD at SOAS University of London, uh, which is actually a decolonial critique of mainstream gender and development, and hopefully you'll be able to read about that soon. Um, and in the past years, uh, since 2016, really, I've been uh, working with the Decolonizing SOAS Working Group, which uh, seeks to explore what decolonization might mean for our institution, um, and uh, leading an initiative on decolonizing research practice in collaboration with the research network of SOAS. So, Monica, I'll pass the word to you. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, welcome. And yeah, my name is Monica Hirma, and I'm currently pursuing my PhD at SOAS in religions and philosophies. And my research lies at the intersection of goddess tradition, South Asian studies, philosophy, decoloniality, and anthropology. Uh, in my project, I do look at the implications that the practice of a contemporary goddess tradition has on notions of gender, body, and ontology. And I, um, I do a decolonial view whereby I sort of criticize the Western um, co-respective Western notions, universalized Western notions of uh, gender, body, and ontology. Uh, before coming to uh, to SOAS, where I have also been teaching, um, over the, been teaching assistant over the last two years in post-colonial gender and queer epistemologies. Um, before coming here, I have been in India for several years, where I was working in the domain of in the realm of culture, and I have pursued my MPhil at the University of Hyderabad. So yes, uh, welcome everyone, and I'm excited to be here for this for this launch. Yes, back Great. to you, Domina. Thank you. And I just realized that Suyash joined us from India. Suyash, can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Great, welcome. So Suyash will also join us uh, in in the second section 
uh, uh, which we will um, introduce our team members, some of our team members. So, so we thought we'd start by giving you a bit of background of how this platform came to be, what our uh, motivations are in the broader vision, and then look at the details of our uh, modus operandi, so how we operate and, and what we envision to implement uh, as a publication model. Um, we will uh, then uh, introduce you to the website, which was just made available to us as well, the first draft. Uh, Monica will uh, tell us more about it, and nearby Sen, who's joining us from India, who is our leading web development team member um, with his team as well. So in the second, after this, we will then have some team members uh, join us. Already we have nearby. Hi, nearby, welcome. Can you hear us? Make sure you're not mute. I think it's still connecting the audio connecting so nearby just uh, just joined us um and then uh, we will have our team members essentially share their own testimonies how they involve how they they are involved with us and how they see this platform evolving but also benefiting their own activities on the ground uh and finally we'll have a sort of panel uh, with international researchers and speakers uh to to explore issues of decolonization multilingualism and publication asymmetries more generally and how this initiative relates to these bigger conversations uh, but also um how these larger debates can inform the platform and and, and the direction we take in the future um so uh I'll, I'll i'll start and then monica will will continue um for those who May have little familiarity with uh, Monica's and my work. We previously co edited the SOAS Journal of Postgraduate Research. Uh, this is a, a journal um, uh, uh, reserved to SOAS postgraduates to showcase their, their, their work. And we took over 2016, I think, right, Monica, when, when we became PhD students, when we started uh, or early after. Um, and uh, immediately we took steps to register the journal formally as an open access, uh, free of charge journal with a double blind peer review. A process that we thought was a bit more transparent and uh, hopefully less biased uh, and we wanted to really open open knowledge uh, had had issues with the idea of knowledge being limited or constrained um, and we wanted to also support the decolonize the student-led decolonizing SOAS movement that was already ongoing in our institution uh, uh, partially inspired by the roads must fall movement in South Africa so we wanted to pursue more sort of more systematically problematize uh, what decolonizing epistemology might mean uh, on behalf of PhD students, but also the, the institution as a whole. Um, and the third and last volume we published, which followed uh, a conference we did with staff and students at SOAS, was uh, dedicated to decolonization in praxis. And this was, again, uh, we showcased how we as students were approaching our disciplines and our practice in a more reflexive and reflective and, and, and critical manner. Um, so decolonial subversions, the current platform, builds on the legacy uh, that, that we have uh, from that experience, uh, not only in terms of our knowledge, in terms of open access publishing and peer review uh, and publication processes, but also on, on built on the relationships we have built so far with uh, web development um, specialists, uh, photographers, and, and the various team members that still continue with us. Um, but with this platform, we really want to uh, uh, pursue this decolonizing Western epistemology more radically and more systematically. We want to provide a dedicated platform uh, for the expression of knowledge systems and perspectives that have been you know, historically underrepresented or marginalized, uh, usually associate, associated with what we call the global south. I tend to avoid these umbrella terms, uh, speaking in terms of scientometrics, so uh, statistics of uh, knowledge production and distribution, the global south would include um, Eastern Europe, Latin America, Africa, uh, parts of Asia, parts of the Middle East, and parts of Oceania. Um, but of course, we're not limited to this geography. We do understand that, that inequalities are, are pervasive uh, and they're not bounded geographically, of course. Um, and we, we truly envision everyone being able to contribute their perspective and their experience and research, uh, no matter where they are located, without feeling that they are constrained materially because they can't pay article processing, fee, processing fees uh, or because they, they need to master English before they published or you know, the politics of citation and peer review that Monica will discuss in detail soon uh, and, and make it make, enable everyone to, to uh, express themselves from where they are essentially, not needing to westernize themselves or to you know, move to the West or, or get a Western education in order to have credibility and to be able to speak. 
Um, so we enable our contributors to publish in any language they feel most comfortable with, uh, as long as we can find peer reviewer and a translation partner in that language. Um, we try to implement a more transparent and less biased peer review process again, uh, based on principles of dialogue between contributors and reviewers. Um, and and in in you know, we we do want to remain uh, connected and be in communication with mainstream academia and knowledge production, uh, because we do hope that over time the kind of knowledge that we produce and distribute and diffuse uh, uh, essentially decentralizes uh, and decenters the mainstream knowledge, right? The mainstream uh, uh, epistemology, and it uh, we we contribute toward a de-westernization and diversification of knowledge production globally. As a strategy, we do encourage our contributors to reference indigenous, female, uh, any marginalized voices and, and groups, uh, not the usual authoritative voices in the West. Uh, but we do not necessarily take anybody as representative of any group or community. I think uh, we do agree that everyone speaks for themselves and uh, we want to really enforce a model of knowledge making that is uh, refocused on lived experience and that makes transparent the positionality of the speaker, the theorist, or the knowledge producer uh, and express, expresses themselves. Um, so essentially more transparency and reflexivity in knowledge production. Uh, but, but our aim, main objective is to depart uh, from a model of knowledge production that uh, rigidly um, you know, limits knowledge production to those who have uh, research funding or affiliations with certain academic institutions. Uh, with the credibility to produce uh, whatever argument. So um, I, I recently um, wrote a paper to convivial, uh, uh, an essay, contributed an essay to convivial thinking, a decolonial platform, and I did analyze there uh, some of the motivations that, that largely uh, uh, describe us as well. Uh, and, and we do think that Western epistemology has been uh, quite uh, exclusivist. Uh, and uh, there has been a disconnect essentially between theory and empirical reality and lived experience. Uh, so we want to really challenge that logic. We want to overcome it uh, by revisiting the very notion of knowledge itself. Knowledge shouldn't be owned, uh, it, you know, it should be freely distributed uh, for the benefit of society. And we're actually very society oriented. Uh, again, Monica will speak on that. Uh, and you'll see it in our first editorial where we outline some of these motivations. Uh, we, we think that often academia has not really been uh, interested in addressing societal problems, rather studying them, and we want to see that, that link uh, re-established. As knowledge produce, producers, we think we have a role to, uh, you know, a responsibility to, to be active in, in, in dealing with these societal issues. Um, so uh, we, we do have uh, this, this flexibility. <laughs> In terms of working with our partners, we do understand that people are coming from different um, sectors and points of view and starting points, and we try to accommodate the needs of our contributors. So we, we try not to be very rigid. Uh, the few stipulations that have in terms of publication uh, are only practical in order to reduce the work uh, that the web ma maintenance team has to have to, have to do uh, when they upload the articles and to keep the costs low for the time being. Um, Undoubtedly, uh, much of this platform uh, reflects, you know, Monica's and my motivations and experience and, and vision. Uh, but, um, you know, from the conversations we've had so far, and you, you'll have the chance to hear from our team members uh, in person. I don't want to speak on their behalf. Uh, but from the conversations we've, we've had so far, uh, we, we really have benefited from everyone's experiences and perspectives and the feedback we received and, and really uh, try to integrate that. I mean, decolonial subversions wouldn't be what it is if we didn't listen to our partners. It's different because we have listened, we've tried, uh, and, we, and we're willing to continue listening, uh, which is why we're trying to facilitate this discussion today. Uh, so far, we are a team, an international team of about um, representing about 11 countries. We have web de designers uh, such as nearby um, uh, photographers, advisors, language partners, translators, reviewers, editorial board members, uh, uh, and uh, the current countries represented, uh, represented include India, Ethiopia, Namibia, Senegal, South Africa, Hong Kong, Hungary, Greece, Moldova, uh, Italy, and the UK. So we hope to expand that uh, and, and include as many 
uh, countries and, and partners uh, as possible. Mm -hmm. And we all uh, we acknowledge all our partners online. Uh, so please take the time to look through the bias to get familiar with who we are. It's not just me and Monica at all. Uh, hopefully, again, by the end of the session, you'll get a better sense of who we are. Um, and, and, and just to pay kudos to our partners, because obviously Monica and I uh, work in an insecure environment. Uh, we've been students, non-local students in London, we have struggled, uh, but our partners uh, have struggled more. You know, certain things that we have a luxury here, uh, we, we take for granted here are a luxury where our partners are. So, you know, even internet connection is quite a challenge. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we're really blessed blessed to have worked with all of you <laughs> so Yash nearby who hear us and everyone else uh, we're, we are really blessed and and we want to thank you uh, today um and we are also grateful for sorry it's emotional because we've tried so hard and it's it's been um it, it's been <sighs> okay, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's been a long. Uh, we we've seen this coming, and and we've worked for the past two years. So, thank you. Uh, we are also grateful for the support of numerous uh, academics at SOAS. I do want to pay uh, kudos to them because uh, in the struggle now with the strikes going on for the casual uh, workers and and um, uh, teaching fellows. Uh, uh you know we we hear this narrative that permanent academics are not supportive but i want to pay kudos to uh professor elena retova who has contributed a piece in this first issue and professor lindy udovi who worked uh, who, who contributed a most supportive forward so please read it uh but also mira sabaratnam and the full decolonizing SOAS working group because they have been supportive and they just granted us a, 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 a funding a small funding amount uh, to cover some of the setup costs for this initiative. Um, and, and since I mentioned uh, funders, I would also like to thank and acknowledge the Esperantic Foundation, uh, Studies Foundation, uh, which has given us some funding under their linguistic justice program. Um, so uh, I, I just, just as a final note, I guess, uh, something more personal. Um, I want to emphasize that you know decolonial subversions for us, and I think I think you've seen that in my motion already, is not just an academic project for us, it's not a research project. We've we've worked voluntarily. Again, our team members can speak uh, on this as well, uh, because it is essentially an existential project. You know, we, we are seeking an alternative way to exist within an, an epistemology and an, a, a knowledge production system that has been hegemonic and ethnocentric. And we're trying to do that in ways that do not require us to relinquish our values and who we are. Um, we, we consider it, as I said, our responsibility to use our epistemic power, being able and privileged to create knowledge, to contribute to that process, uh, to use it responsibly, to use it critically, to use it reflexively, uh, to give back to society as well. Um, we are not currently uh, registered as an organization. Uh, but we are taking steps to ensure that we can fundraise uh, transparently and ethically. Uh, we are looking at different options and, and, um, and how we can do that best. Uh, as I said, we have been working voluntarily. Monica, myself, or all our team members have been uh, contributing time and energy and, and uh, specializations for free. Uh, literally, well, for the time being, nearby Sen will, will speak on, on the development of the website, uh, uh, which you know, he has been working on even when we were unable to pay that and to cover those uh, that service cost. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that with the funding we just received. And we do uh, actually, uh, we do want to show to the people that you don't need research funding to create something that is visionary and can bring people together. But we do, we do not want to encourage work for free either. So we're, we actually have a business model that we wish to implement soon, and uh, we're moving toward registering this initiative as a social enterprise, essentially, that can be of benefit to the members, but also to society. Um, so without further ado, I'll now pass the floor to Monica to uh, take us through the modus operandi and the details, uh, and then we'll move to the team members. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Romina, for this yeah, comprehensive introduction to the colonial subversions and to the outline of our philosophy behind it. And again, hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today uh, from all around the world in these very particular and challenging times. Uh, I would like to premise my introduction by highlighting that some of our speakers 
um, in particular, Bimala Katikaneni, Sharmila Chauhan, and uh, Alena Retova could not join us today precisely due to these circumstances. Also, I would like to point out that the platform that we are presenting today is still a work in progress. Mm. Precisely, again, due to the same issues since our IT partners have been working under a very strict lockdown in India, unable, for example, to access their monitors and systems at their offices, or even to communicate um, smoothly between themselves since they are in different locations currently. So uh, we beg <laughs> for your understanding for that and uh, keep um, checking the, the platform over the next couple of days and weeks when we will uh, finalize everything. But um, yeah, I think we, we are already at a very good point and you get a really good overview of what we are working at. Um, yeah, we also regret that we cannot meet personally, but also rather than postponing this launch, we felt this could be an opportunity to catalyze our energies and to use the excitement for our common cause to get through difficult times. Now, my intent over the next few minutes is to provide you with a slightly more detailed overview of how we operate in order to fulfill our vision, not only for a decolonial way of producing knowledge, but importantly, also of legitimizing and eventually of distributing it. Thereafter, I will hand it over to our web team who will lead us through this platform. So while in recent years, decolonization has become increasingly popular across everyday parlance, as well as academic discourses, it seems to have thus far, however, failed to deliver the radical ruptures and the revolutionary transformations of the world order that have been envisioned by anti-colonial practitioners and intellectuals. While obviously a systematic and comprehensive undertaking that includes politics, economics, and radical, uh, sorry, and racial discourses, and much more is required to counter the current exploitative marginalizations that are undertaken by Western hegemonic forces. Um, while one needs much more, however, with regards to publishing, we think that we have identified a series of pragmatic points of action that we hope will facilitate a decolonial knowledge in its widest sense. It is important that we speak of a decolonial modus operandi and of pragmatic points of action as opposed to merely decolonial content. In fact, decolonial content can nowadays be found in abundance across various disciplines. What is still dissatisfactory, however, is how this content is created, by which and whose regimes of truth it is legitimized, um, and who is producing it. Without addressing these last issues, decolonial content risks to remain, in fact, a facade that uh, is, remains wanting of implementation. So when looking closer at this discrepancy between decolonial content and decolonial modes of producing knowledge, we see that there is a paradox that becomes evident whereby decolonization is vigorously advocated um, while institutions, however, remain firmly embedded within structures that reaffirm oppressive power relations, uh, which are actually not very different from how freedom, self-determination and equality were pursued by colonial regimes at home while negating the very same values to non-Western subjugated populations. By envisioning a decolonial modus operandi and breaking free from current systems of um, knowledge legitimation, we are aware that we, as well as our contributors, may, fa may face a lot of challenges since we, precisely since we operate outside the parameters adopted by mainstream institutions. And thus, we are particularly grateful to the contributors of decolonial subversions who have accepted, accepted this challenge. Uh, often at, odd, at odds with their interests in pursuing careers in mainstream academia. So we thank everyone for being with us on this journey. Um, for example, in insisting that contributors in their works resort to thinkers and, ref, um, and references from the global south, no less than from the global north, as well as to female um, references, no, long, no, 
no less than male authors, we break away from the, cy the cycle of self-perpetuating Western, primarily male, epistemic dominance. This, however, comes at the cost of being, at least initially, precluded from becoming an indexed journal as decolonial subversions. Um, because to become an indexed journal, one has to already have a number of publications whose articles present bibliographies that reference articles which in turn are published in already indexed journals. So do you see what I mean? There is a um, self-affirming process uh, of knowledge production um, which we want to break free from. Mm -hmm. We will thus, uh, since, we, we, since there are these difficulties, we will have to look at alternative metrics uh, for our, in, in our contributions, such as, for example, the geographical area where contributions are being downloaded and the number of languages within which they are uh, being translated and thus the type of public and readers that they can reach. One of the most evident features of decolonial subversions is the range of the types of contributions we publish. These may vary in fact from written to acoustic to visual, since we believe that knowledge comes in no prescribed form. By giving visuals and audios as much importance as texts, we wish to move away from the idea, uh, deeply rooted in Western academia, that knowledge comes first and foremost in the form of text. Also, audio and visual formats allow a multitude of people who have not necessarily been exposed to or trained in predominantly text-based knowledge production to share their stories and knowledges in ways that are close to their modes of expression. Mm -hmm. In our first volume, in fact, we have written as well as acoustic contributions, as you will see later on in a minute. And we also aim to, our, to have our first visual contributions very soon. Moreover, just as um, different types of knowledge are best expressed through different formats, so also our texts come in different styles. Generally, academic knowledge is associated with a standard model of linear argumentation, which foresees an introduction, the presentation of data, an analysis, and a conclusion. Mm -hmm. While this is only one of many modes of presenting knowledge, it has been elevated as universal, considerably disadvantaging those who have different ways of arguing and presenting information. We, instead, we invite uh, contributors to remain loyal to their modes of building argumentations and analysis that are expressive of their own cultural domains. In fact, when reducing arguments stemming from non-anglophone contexts to linearity, analytical processes are not only subjected to artificial constraints, but often also undergo a very crucial loss of meaning. For this reason, in this volume, contributions range from classical essay format to dialogue, to opinion pieces, and to a manifesto. And we are open to many, many more, such as poetry, fairy tales, journalistic contributions, blog entries, and so forth. So it's a very vast range of, of uh, types of knowledge production that we invite here. Despite the variety of formats and styles that we embrace, we also want to ensure that the contributions meet the highest standards, obviously, of rigor and of excellence. For this, we resort to a double uh, peer review process, but with some deviations from the traditional review process. Mm -hmm. Firstly, we allow contributors to choose between a blind and an open peer review process. While standard scholarly peer review processes are anonymous, uh, we acknowledge that at times the protection of anonymity can lead to unwarranted aggressiveness and usurpation of power. Moreover, it is known that in highly specific areas of knowledge, as some of you may have also experienced personally, um, the omission of an author's credentials does not really guarantee anonymity. So we do want to avoid such hypocrisies and allow our contributions to choose between anonymous and non-anonymous peer review. Where the contributors are known, also the reviewers are expected to be disclosed and vice versa. In this volume already, a number of contributors have indeed opted for an open peer review, and we hope that the open dialogue established between reviewer and author can lead to uh, future collaborations between the two parties. 
Additionally, our peer review process um, ensures that knowledge is not exclusively filtered through thinkers. Monica, sorry, I just received a, a message from somebody that your, your sound is not good. Um, so I wonder if we could turn a uh, shift to your live stream. Do you, could you share the link from your live stream? Okay. And, and we can see if that sounds better. Uh, if I have to do, I think my, my audio is not capturing you well. Um, which I could set up again, but it would take me more time than if we revert to your live stream. Apologies for, for, for that. Okay, wait, now I'm a little bit challenged when it comes to these things. Uh, so on, on your record system, as you're recording, there is a, a link in your live stream. Is there a link that is provided? Uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, no, I can see sh share, but so that's on the Okay, uh, what we could do is uh, we can stop it for, for five minutes and restart and I will fix the audio on my end. Would that, would that work? I think so. Okay, so let's, let's stop it, uh, take a break and we will continue. Please uh, wait with us for, for five minutes to reestablish re this. Um, Um, so I will st I will try to reset the, uh, set this up again. Apologies. Uh, Rumina, I sent you a link. I don't know whether this is what you meant actually. Okay, I am already resetting this um, to to. I'm setting up a second link essentially. Um, I'm setting up a new a, a new live stream, uh, which I can start immediately. So just bear with us for a few minutes. It's uh, it happens. It's the technical issues we were discussing. Uh, hopefully, we will be back on track in, in a few minutes. Okay, so now I need... <laughs> uh, okay. And restart and I will fix the audio on my end. Would that would that work? I think so. Okay, so let's let's stop it, uh, take a break, and we will continue. Please as uh, wait with us for, for five minutes to re reestablish this. Um, sorry Monica, I just um
So I think, Monica, the problem is that the audio wasn't captured. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm also good. So let I'm also getting message that it was clear. My audio was actually clear. So I don't know maybe whether this was at the particular person's receiver's end that it was not clear or whether it was my my laptop. So it it was not lost on other um, on other listeners. So I see. Um, I'm trying to see if your if your uh, link is still working. Um. Okay. Well, I, I'm I'm also good. Oh, Monica, your link is working. So we will share your link on social media. So plan B is working. <laughs> um, so let me just share share the link with our tutor uh, members. One second. It might have been clear, but I'm, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, with so many computers connected, we don't know when it is. <laughs> we don't know what, what is working, what is not. Uh, so Monica, yeah. I think you should continue speaking. I'm just sharing the, I'm sharing the, the link, the new link with everyone. On okay, so should I go on? Should I continue yes. with our process? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry everyone for this interruption and thanks for, for still being with us and for your patience. <laughs> patience. So I was just going through our peer review process, which is uh, we, we offer the option of having it open as well as blind. And then additionally, uh, we ensure also that the knowledge is not exclusively uh, filtered through thinkers from the global north. And in fact, each submission will be reviewed by at least one um, expert on the topic from the global south. Moreover, it goes without saying, obviously, also that where a contribution is by an academic, it will be reviewed by an academic. Where it is by an activist, it will be reviewed by an activist. An artist will be reviewing an artist's work, and so on. Uh, reviewers, despite ensuring that a piece reaches its best shape, are unfortunately often not acknowledged. Uh, for their hard and rigorous work. Um, we, are we are trying to change this. And in fact, in our platform, you will be able to see all of the bios of the, the reviewers as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, coming to the next point, similarly to formats and styles, we also emphasize the need um, for contributors around the world to be able to publish in the languages they are most comfortable with. Firstly, um, the authors whose first language is not uh, whose first language is not um, English are generally forced to write in English in order to reach a, a, a wider audience, and uh, this subjects them to linguistic and epistemic violence, since certain concepts and processes of thinking do not translate into anglophone cultures and vice versa. Secondly, translation into English of texts originally formulated in other languages may also not do justice to the author's intentions. So it is for this reason um, that each contribution will be published in its original language on decolonial subversions, as well as in an English version. In this volume, for example, we already have a number of contributions that are uh, not English. We have Swahili, Hungarian, and Esperanto, and we are uh, working on expanding this, this range uh, considerably. We also acknowledge that translations are much more than simple one-on-one -on -one correspondences between words of different languages, and do require that translators are profoundly familiar with the cosmological frameworks of both languages. And it's for this reason that um, we also uh, make it a point to really acknowledge all our translators for their hard work and you will find again in our platform a list uh, with the bios of all the translators. Finally, among the main decolonial principles that we implement, uh, decolonial subversions commits to publishing open access, rigorously open access, whereby all content is freely available to readers, viewers and listeners everywhere. Too frequently, in fact, publications can be accessed only via expensive subscriptions, which create a large imbalance, once again, between the Global North and Global South. And it is particularly disturbing when knowledge that builds on collaborations with people from 
uh, the Global South is made inaccessible to the very protagonists of, su of such studies. And in fact, not only is then the knowledge consumption limited to a readership that is financially advantaged, but importantly, a healthy dialogue with, um, with the protagonist is foreclosed and obviously also potential rebukes. So we again would self, we would perpetuate a knowledge that is uh, only within the, the sphere of, you know, uh, privileged global knowledge. So this is something again that we want to avoid through open access. Um, these are just some of the principles which I have now enumerated that are outlined also in our basic manifesto, which uh, we will see shortly. And importantly, they are also part of a work in progress. Uh, it is a forever open-ended um, work, and we are always ready to take on and make space for new voices and new understandings of decolonization. We are hoping to grow in this all together. Again, as Romina already said, it's not just Romina and I, it is a large team of international players here and voices. Um, so yeah, unfortunately my time now is running out and I cannot provide you with an overview of the content of the different contributions of this first volume, but I invite you, once we now um, launch the website, to go through it, to click through it by yourselves and um, yeah, and explore it. So this now brings me to expand the conversation and to, to introduce our international partners, starting with Nirbhai Sen, who has developed the design for the web page as well as the layout of the contributions. Uh, Nirbhai has been working tirelessly with us since the time Romina and I edited the, journal, the source journal of postgraduate research in 2016 and is once more delivering an outstanding work despite the difficulties currently faced with the severe lockdown implemented in India. Nirbhai is director of GMIS, a graphical monitoring and information system consultancy in Hyderabad, India. And among the projects, GMIS um, has produced a comprehensive mapping for a water atlas, worked with the French Ministry of Research and UNESCO. Um, Donna, the source before Sorry, I asking Nirbhai to walk us through the webpage, I would also like to thank Mukesh Manda, who has provided invaluable input for the planning of the webpage, and Guru Rao, who has worked closely with Nirbhai. And now I leave it over to you, Nirbhai. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi guys. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Can yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, Monica and Romina are always too kind. Uh, keep talking about my tireless work, but their work ethic is unparalleled. Uh, yeah, we did have uh, uh, experience a few issues because I can't be with my with the person who was coding Guru. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there was a little bit of communication breakdown and things, but we've managed to get as much, I think, most of the things online. Uh, and over the next few days, if there are any things, we'll be ironing them out. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, um, so I don't know how we're going to do the website. Uh, are we going to show it on screen? Uh, so, since yeah. Monica is now live streaming, then Monica, you would need to showcase it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which is even better, probably. I was ready to showcase it, but I think it will uh, capture the live stream on Monica's laptop. Uh, it, it should capture your main screen as well. This is uh, playing with fire, giving Monica technical. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I just wanted to. Um, so I don't know how we're. Well, it seems to me that Monica might have not set up the capture main screen, so then. Uh, the, the audience, the viewers wouldn't be able to see what you show them on your screen, Monica. I think nearby we'll have to rely on just describing it and then no. we'll make it. Yes, Monica? Um, can you tell me how to make, how to do that? That, that should have been done before in the settings. Uh, if you remember, it should uh, capture main screen, uh, which should work automatically, but uh, it probably won't do it for you now. I know. Um, I'm watching you live okay. and I can see it. So, so yeah. in that case, I, I would nearby I would just oh, describe it. Uh, you know, yeah, the yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, when I was discussing the the website and the idea with Romina and Monica, mm -hmm. uh, I came up with an. Um, I 
I was thinking about what sort of themes we could use and the idea of using eCut textiles as mm -hmm. the background for the website uh, came to me because uh, eCut, as far as I know, represents a sort of common thread between, you know, South America, Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and isn't really present in uh, what Romina doesn't like to call the global north. Um, <laughs> And it's also, it's a handloom uh, activity. It's uh, practiced by some of the most marginalized people mm -hmm. on the planet. It's not mass produced um, and it's absolutely gorgeous. So I thought that that might be a good theme to go with, with the website. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that we decided that was that we wouldn't um, uh, make... Hello, sorry. Romina. Yes, Elias. Um, can't you share it? Uh, but you, you can share it, I think. You, you I can share his desktop, I think. Uh, I cannot share it on my uh, Instagram. I think he, he, he can do it. We are not live streaming from my uh, I think he can do it from his angle. Ah. Uh, Nirvai, I, Nirvai can, I can share, share it, it from his I, angle. I can yeah, share I, it there, is, there is a share option. Yeah, yeah. Get into that. Yeah. And you can share your desktop. Okay. Perfect. Um, oh, awesome. Awesome. Do you, do you see it? Yeah. One sec, I better close my yeah. emails and things. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> hide, hide things. <laughs> uh, do you see the website? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, so you can see this is the, the cover page and with the eCut background, one of the eCut uh, backgrounds. Hmm. And uh, uh, what I like about the cover page is that there's this little motif of these arrows that point from the down, uh, from down up. Uh, so a little bit like symbolizing subversion. Uh, so that's why I chose it for the home page. And you'll see that there's a lack of menu here. And it's so something that we discussed as well, which was that uh, we don't think that we want to give the message of people doing something slightly more deliberate and slow on the website rather than jumping from one page to another. You, you put in a menu that people are never going to use because they don't need to go from one particular page to a very specific page somewhere else. Most of the time they'll explore the, the website uh, once or twice initially. Uh, they won't be jumping all over the place and then they'll be going to specific places afterwards. So we wanted to keep it clean, keep it calm and centered and uh, not give the idea of people jumping around. Mm -hmm. um, Monica really wanted uh, the manifesto to be front and center. Mm -hmm. So if you see, like uh, if you roll over manifesto and the written acoustic and visual, they are highlighted uh, more boldly than the other boxes. Um, just to guide people to these uh, things. Um, some of these pages will be uh, modified a bit in the, in the future, uh, mm -hmm. but I'll just uh, go through. So this is the manifesto. Um, then you can go back to the home page. You have the partners here with the institutional partners and the language partners. Um, mm -hmm. Then we have uh, how you can get involved. So you have uh, becoming a contributor, becoming a reviewer, becoming a translator, and you have the calls for contributions, guidelines, criteria for submission, uh, acknowledgments, plagiarism. I don't know how much in detail you want me to uh, go into these things. Uh, then again, with the reviewers, the peer review process, the guidelines for the reviewers. Uh, we thought that uh, the first priority was to put up as much information as possible. Uh, and then we would fix any uh, visual issues with the website. And this is for the translation, translation process and guidelines to become a translator. Um, <clears throat> then we have uh, uh, the vision of the website mm -hmm. a, in About Us. And uh, we have uh, ethical protocols the uh the description of the uh of the founding members and uh advisory board i think there's also the editorial board there's a technical team i'm not going to show my blurb because i didn't write one um and uh <clears throat> the status of uh the whole project Th thank you um yeah yeah I, 
I, I think that that is probably suffices. Yeah. We will share a yeah. link okay. uh, for the yeah. public sure. to look at it sure. and, and go through it. So, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'm just going to uh, show you the acoustic and written. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this is the main portion of the website, which is at the bottom. Um, here you can access the PDF. And this is an example of one of the PDFs with the cover page, and this is Rumina's article. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, and there is also uh, a couple of entries in the acoustic uh, with embedded uh, players to play the acoustic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the visual, as was mentioned earlier, is coming soon. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's a menu on top where you can see the quotation marks. That will be for future when the website is translated into other languages and we'll be able to filter uh, based on language content mm -hmm. and to share and search. Uh, so I think that's about it. Is there anything else you'd like to know? It, it's very well done. Congratulations. Okay. So we are Thank very you. excited to see the final product. Uh, Monica, any Thank other you. thoughts? Uh, no, I'm I'm super excited about it, and uh, yes, thank you, Nirvai, <laughs> for walking us through it. And I invite the, our viewers to uh, then go through, through it, explore it on their own. And so uh, right now, uh, in mm -hmm. the uh, there's a, it's on a temporary link uh, yeah. because uh, while we have the um, the domain name, a uh, couple of domain names for decolonial subversions. The uh, server space uh, thing has not been finalized, so that will be done in a couple of days. So right now it's on a temporary link. It's still accessible to everyone, um, but in a couple of days it will be on the de uh, decolonial.org. Yeah, and mm -hmm. decolonial numbers. Yeah, and thank you so much, Nirvai. Uh, it's it looks amazing, and um, yeah, to our viewers, I I. I invite you to go through it and to really also uh, see the various, the abstracts of the various contributions. We have uploaded currently a few of the contributions and over the next few days we will upload the entire first volume. So uh, stay tuned in. Um, and now I would like to pass on to, um, to our next speaker, part of our international team, uh, Suyash Barvin. Uh, Suyash has studied film direction and screenwriting in India. Uh, after which he worked as an associate producer and media consultant before switching to academics to concentrate on his long-term interest of working in participatory media for social development. And as I understand, he's going to start his PhD in September. Um, he is, yeah, he is one of the members of the advisory board of the Colonial Subversions. And now I, uh, let us welcome Suyash and uh, up to you, Suyash, to tell us something more about your experience. So Yash, can you hear us? You're still muted, so you need to unmute yourself. Hi, um, my connection, yes, my, yeah, yes, uh, my connection, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I'm just wondering if I should just turn off my video because my, um, just the internet connection is so unstable. I couldn't catch any of uh, Nirbhai's uh, walk through the website. Mm. Um, I mean, I was kind of looking forward to that, but maybe it's just better that I just turn off my video. So it's... Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Uh, 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 Suyash? Oh, oh no. Hmm. Some way or, one way or the other, I could. Could you hear me? Can, can you hear me, guys? No. Yes, Suyash, now we can hear you. All right. Okay. So, um, I mean, I really want to thank you uh, both. And uh, it's a wonderful, uh, you know, opportunity to get to meet, um, you know, virtually uh, the partners uh, from you know from different parts of the world it's it's a really exciting moment um, for me um, I guess it's kind it's also you know one of my first involvements in an academic sense um, uh, you know so I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm really kind of very eager to participate in uh, you know in the kind of initiatives that 
uh, that decolonial subversions is going to have in or is going to lead in the coming uh, in the in the years to come uh, so my involvement uh, you know at this at this stage is uh, has been as a contributor i have uh, written an article on um, on mainstream cinema in india and how it represents uh, certain subaltern populations uh, specifically, I am looking at how um, Dalits, who are um, marginalized communities in India, are, um, you know, increasingly, uh, you know, there, there are uh, there are there are films that are being made by Dalit filmmakers, uh, which are talking about the Dalit condition, uh, which are talking about, um, you know, like a certain kind of identity which uh, which cannot be bracketed within the, you know necessarily within the kind of identity that that you would have uh, being presented by uh, by the mainstream bollywood or the hindi film industry per se or even regional film industries um, you know which are more commercial and and kind of you know audience and and blockbuster driven so uh, it's really the way that i'm kind of interpreting the project of of decolonizing something because i i feel uh, there are there are many layers to it that have to be peeled that have to be peeled back and and one of the things that i keep uh, asking myself or uh, it, it's kind of like you know one of the the premises of of any kind of academic inquiry is um, i do is about trying to understand how uh, power economic power social power uh, or cultural power or you know is is concentrated in the hands of uh, certain, you know, political economic elites uh, who have stayed on in the, you know, you know, especially in India. In the case of India, um, and, you know, the, the transfer of power from the, the British imperial rule to, um, you know, to, to the native um, population, to, to the, uh, you know, to, to domestic governments is, um, has not really kind of, you know, it did not really produce like a, a, a big shift in, in terms of the hegemony um, of, um, you know, in terms of the existing hegemony of sorts. So um, there are, there are concepts that, you know, in, in the, in the course of, in the course of, you know, the, the, the work that I have done, I have, I've tried to kind of question what it means um to uh to have these kinds of power structures intact um where it doesn't really matter you know uh, you know where, you know who is the uh kind of governing power uh let's say um so i'm i'm looking at these kinds of structures of power and specifically how they proliferate how they intersect with the you know with 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 the cultural industry with with cultural representations um so that's the way that I'm kind of that. That's the way that I'm approaching this idea of decolonizing um, knowledge or decolonizing representation. Um, and I feel like this is it's something that um, I struggled myself when I was when I was a student in the UK uh, with with trying to with trying to get uh, reviewers or trying to get uh, faculty or sometimes even a lot of my time was spent in contextualizing the the environment the society the culture i come from uh, so that i could get to make a certain uh, kind of a p political point um and and i and i've always and i've always realized the the kind of position that i have to you know the kind of privileged position that i have of representing, uh, you know, the place where I come from at at the global stage, and then it, you know, it also kind of makes me think about the kind of inequalities that uh, that exist, you know, even back in India, where, you know, certain people of a certain caste uh, get have the prerogative of representing the whole of society. Um, so that that's really how I kind of see see it. Like I feel like it's it's a constant negotiation. Um, that I'm doing uh, with the kind of you know knowledge that I want to produce, uh, with the kind of contributions that I want to uh, make in uh, you know through through articles or through academic research um, and so forth. Um, I guess my my involvement in um, you know in in this in the in this platform is also uh, a way in which uh, I can contribute um, my skills as a you know, as someone who's been involved in um, media consultancy, who's been involved in 
leading uh, communications projects for uh, non-profit organizations, for, uh, you know, whether they're corporate foundations or whether they're grassroots level NGOs and uh, really trying to um, try, trying to see how, uh, you know, as Romina mentioned in her, uh, in the introduction about how it can, about how this platform has multiple uh, kinds of possibilities of uh, getting in different kinds of content from audiovisual contributions to <laughs> blog entries. Uh, so, so this is, this is broadly, you know, the kind of work that I would uh, like to, you know, also uh, evolve or organically evolve through discussions with, uh, you know, with, with other partners uh, from feedback from, you know, the, the, uh, the readers, the, the viewers of this, um, of this webcast also uh, to understand how, uh, you know, what, what kind of, um, what kind of knowledge could be created? What kind of, uh, you know, what what could be put up there, which is, uh, you know, which has, uh, which is kind of participatory, where we are uh, opening the, uh, where we are also getting in contributions from from people who are activists, who are not just in the academic field, but who could be journalists, for example, who could be practitioners of media, uh, who could be volunteers. Let's say uh, how you know how how this could evolve into something um which is you know which is of a certain standard which is which has um uh, you know which something which basically becomes like a resource um you know beyond the academic world alone where the outreach um would you know it it would it would draw in people from from all sorts um you know from all kinds of backgrounds mm -hmm. um so so that's really that that's really the kind of you know uh, that's that's really the the kind of contribution that i see uh, myself you know uh, that that that's the kind of stuff that i see myself doing with um, with this platform uh and uh, it's an incredible opportunity for me to grow uh you know as i said like it's kind of like really early days for me in my academic career as such uh and i feel you know uh, that Monica and Romina have done uh, a great job in introducing uh, what the platform is about. So um, it it really you know it it really resonates it really resonates with me. So I'm I'm very happy to be involved in all of this, uh, and I'm really looking forward to actually uh, you know more than kind of talking about what what you know what I can do. It's more about what what we could do together. What we could. Mm -hmm. Uh, also uh, accomplished through brainstorming different ideas uh, through you know getting in different kinds of um, you know concepts on board running with them um, and you know doing things organically through feedback uh, and I'm really looking forward to you know in to taking this forward in in that sense um, so mm -hmm. I I don't know how much of this I have managed to you know I don't know if if everyone could hear me yeah. I could just I could just you know I could see you guys nodding so I guess uh, <laughs> you could hear me all right and uh, so I would leave it there and thank you very much once again for uh, getting me involved uh, and I really look forward to to working with you. Thank, Thank you so much, you so much Suryaj. Uh, thanks for giving us your background and how you envision being involved. And yeah, I must say we have already also uh, started discussing various things that uh, Suryaj can uh, mm -hmm. do more in, in, in his field, which is yeah, media and, and video and all of this. So there are a lot of ideas brewing. <laughs> um, and okay. Suryaj has also helped us with the, with the Twitter uh, diffusion and some translation. So yes, thank you very much. And, and if, if I may add, Monica, I just want to say that we really uh, want everyone to benefit from this initiative while you're benefiting the initiative it, itself, right? It's not uh, for to, to promote ourselves. We want, uh, you know, people like Suyash, uh, you know, as you pursue your own activities and your research and your practice, uh, to make to own this to make this part of your project right part of your vision as well and benefit it, benefit from it as well uh, as well as contribute you know your energy and, and ideas that we can then integrate so i really appreciate what you said suyash about uh, exploring what we can do together i'm putting that on twitter as we speak <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. okay now we move on to our next uh, partner 
uh, Elias Gib. Sorry, I'm. Gabriel Celeste. Yeah, I'm sorry, Elias. <laughs> um, no problem. Yeah, thank you. So Elias joins us from Ethiopia. He's a final year theology st student at Holy Trinity Theological University in Addis Ababa. And he's one of our language partners. And although he has not yet worked with us on this platform, he has been working with Romina for a couple of years on the development of an Amharic website mm -hmm. that aims to address also uh, yeah, societal issues, including gender uh, through theology. And yeah, I, I leave it now to Elias to tell us a little bit more about how he envisions uh, yeah, profiting from like uh, decolonial subversion. <coughs> and working together on this uh, on this idea on this platform. Okay. Welcome, Elias. And that next. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> shall, shall we keep talking in Amharic? In no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, English and yes, fellow girls, that I get Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Um, you are doing a great job. Uh, Romina and Monica. Uh, thank you very much. I'm enjoying this very much. As uh, uh, Monica was introducing me, my name is Elias Kuroslasi. I'm from uh, Ethiopia, the Salva, the capital. Um, so I am here as a translator. Um, that's uh, how I am going to take part in the future. <laughs> so my, um, <clears throat> the thing is like, um, this uh, political uh, colonization, which started like uh, as it is known in history from the 50th century, it is believed to have like ended in the 20th century. Actually, it, it did end, but the epistemic, epistemic um, uh, colonization is on place now. You know, like <clears throat> the Western um, knowledge, if the Eurocentric view is considered superior over uh, the other forms of knowledge and now it is like influencing um, the global south very much like mm -hmm. Ethiopia our country like my country is uh, one of uh, the it's like uh, if you have read the uh, history of our country like beginning from the 20th century uh, starting from uh, the time of His Majesty uh, in the traditional way of uh, education was like completely changed overnight, was replaced by the Western system, the Eurocentric uh, system. Mm -hmm. And now that created a bigger gap, especially in the transmission of knowledge, like a big chasm, like because the traditional system was persistent for thousands of years. If you know the, the story of the, the history of the country, like, um, Ethiopia is a very old uh, country state and like the educational system, especially the uh, religious educational system was very stable and it was the well-known, uh, it changed overnight, you know, like mm -hmm. that created a bigger gap and that caused chaos, you know, like especially in the time of Derg, violence is like everywhere country so we, we we the country is not rectified from that yet you know so there is a big problem so decolonization is very seriously needed here like uh most of us are not aware of it there are some people like who are uh, working uh, on this area i already uh, contacted those people by the way uh so i, I will try to um them uh, or to just to involve them in this uh, initiative Mm -hmm. um so uh this uh, the alien system the new system to be, has to be put in equilibrium you know like mm -hmm. it shouldn't be given the uh, superiority so um on that on that regard the things need to be um done so i'm i'm really happy to take part in this like in the future um if there is anything more I shall uh, be contributing on, like uh, I would, uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to do so. But in the meantime, like <clears throat> I will, I will be happy to 
uh, take part in the uh, initiative mm -hmm. uh, in doing this translation. I mean, so um, as Monica earlier mentioned, like mentioned earlier, um, I worked with Romina. Romina knows Ethiopia. She came here in 18 percent. Uh, we did some translation works being with a colleague of mine named Fesambet. Mm -hmm. So um, I will be happy to continue doing that. <clears throat> um, the, the program is very necessary. It is crucial, I believe. Um, and in the future, I think it will, it will solve um, big problems, like many problems. It will um, bring many changes. Like if it is then according to the, um, I, I read the manifesto, I was listening to Monica earlier. It was excellent. Like if we are acting accordingly, uh, it will bring change. Like it, it's, it's very important. Miss you guys, like it is, it's very important. Um, <clears throat> uh, so um, this is all that uh, could be said by my side as I am not taking that much part. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, considering me um, as a member. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Elias. Thank you so much. And yeah, we are looking forward to working uh, closely with you more also in the yeah in the. Um, uh, in the future. And just to, to add, sorry, Monica, to interrupt again, um, just wanted to say that uh, Elias has been an excellent, excellent translator. I, I've been translating for a long time in multiple languages, uh, being involved in multiple initiatives, and translating theological language in particular uh, is very difficult, it's a very sensitive task. Uh, but he's been working with me very diligently and conscientiously. And I just want to pay kudos to all the translators because this is such a, you, you know, we've had these conversations. Translation is not just translating words, but translating whole systems of thinking and knowledge uh, and metaphysics. And it's uh, it's not simple because you, there's a lot of at stake as well. And uh, language is limiting in itself and English in particular. So thank you, Elias. Yeah, okay. Oh, and Thank you, thank you. Yes, and with Elias, we have um, concluded our little presentation of of, of a partial uh, portion of our international partners. As I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, several uh, could not join us because of the current situation and inaccessibility to systems. Um, so yeah, now we move on to the to the um, third part of this presentation of the with, with our panelists, and I uh, leave it over to Romina, who is going to introduce. Them. Yes, I, I, and I think we have Martin already. Martin, hello. Can you hear us well? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I'm sorry for the technical issues. I believe that uh, on Twitter, so the people who are watching from home can hear us well, but they can't see everyone they can only see monica because it's live streaming from from her laptop i think that's the disruption uh, but we are recording everything on zoom so hopefully we'll make available an acoustic uh, launch so all the conversations hopefully in high quality could be released afterwards just uh, remember that um so to introduce martin uh, martin is a good friend of mine uh he joins us from hungary i believe right martin yeah uh, he's uh, so Do Dr. Martin uh, Demeter is founder and co-editor of Comi, an international journal of pure communication inquiry, and he has written extensively on the open access movement and uh, global knowledge production asymmetries. I think Martin, your book is on the way, on its way. Uh, we look forward to reading it, and he's also a member of our uh, uh, um, advisory board. So uh, thank you for being part of our initiative, Martin, and uh, I'll just pass the word to you. Okay, uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, yes, very well. Okay, super. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. I just uh, seen the, the design of the, the website and it is outstanding. I, I, like, it, uh, I like it so much. And, uh, and I have a cheat sheet because I, I want to keep the seven uh, minutes. So, can so you I do. Can I, find, uh, from Hungary, I believe. Right, Martin? Yeah. Uh, he's okay, I just. Everything is okay? Because yeah, yeah. I, I think somebody played the link somewhere in the background. <laughs> you go <okay>. ahead. <laughs> yes. So first, I would like to start with a quotation for, uh, from the manifesto you, you have just published. Uh, it, it wrote that uh, while the multidisciplinary integration of a decolonial theoretical perspective gives the impression that the reach of decolonism has been extensive, in our experience, 
it is often limited to philosophical discussion or live stories uh, without its uh, without its embodied praxis. In fact, the centrality of the decolonization discourse often disguises the lack of substantive uh, changes in attitudes, norms, and structures that such a discourse should have produced. And, and I just uh, selected this, these lines because this observation substantially fits for my own experiences mm -hmm. at uh, both as a scholar that tries to develop his own uh, career in a global context and mm -hmm. as a richer researcher who analyzed uh, global inequalities in knowledge production. Uh, basically, I, I am uh, working on three uh, different uh, fields. The first is uh, that I analyze uh, uh, the publication output patterns in publication collabor and uh, publication collaborations. I have made several analyses in different disciplines, but basically in social sciences, including uh, communication and media research, development studies, and also in sociology. Uh, and I find that the vast majority of papers published in leading international journals, uh, in, some, in some disciplines it can be 100%. Okay, so there are several elite uh, central journals without any global uh, South content, but uh, basically it's almost uh, every case is, uh, is uh, beyond 90%. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and they are published by Western authors almost exclusively. Uh, but this is not just they are Western authors, but those authors who are part of the so-called Western elite, uh, who are educated at Western uh, elite universities. Uh, for example, in the case of French, the, the, these are the Grand École or the Russell Group uh, universities in the UK or the Ivy League or other private universities uh, mm -hmm. at the United States. So we have the periphery at the center phenomenon. So when we say that Western scholars write almost every article in elite journals, it doesn't mean that all the Western scholars. So there are uh, very, very, uh, there are many researchers working at Western universities, but not the top universities. They are just as uh, uh, disadvantageous than, than, for example, Hungarian or African or Latin American scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, being central refers to not just the geopolitical location, but also signifies social status because typically uh, it represents upper class people who occupy the greatest part in appointing their children to top universities and consequently to top positions in the world of global knowledge production. Back to the manifesto, while in many disciplines, uh, decolonization or, or uh, as it uh, often calls, the de westernization uh, discourse uh, started to develop in a, in the last uh, few decades and that they, uh, <clears throat> and they, uh, there are some cases when uh, leading scholars started the westernization project for example in my closer discipline which is communication studies what Silvio Weisbord he is he was the the editor in chief of journal of communication which is the absolutely top uh, journal in the field. So mm -hmm. this is the flagship journal of the International Communication Association. And Louise Ha, who is the editor-in-chief of journalism and mass communication quarterly, another uh, elite journal, both of them started a devastation uh, uh, initiative. They, they say that devastation is, is needed and it is a wonderful thing. But when I analyze these two uh, journals, I find that uh, there are no practical devastation. So in, uh, yeah. uh, since 1997, for example, to nowadays, the, the proportion of, of peripheral authors uh, doesn't uh, raise or doesn't, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, under 2%, just like it was uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to agree with the manifesto that uh, decolonization and devastation uh, project are part of a philosophical um, tradition, or they are fancy to say, but uh, of, uh, unfortunately nothing uh, substantial happened in a field. Uh, my other field of research is, is uh, to, to analyze the geopolitical diversity, diversity of editorial board members, and uh, the situation is very same uh, than in the case of publication patterns. In, in those gatekeeping positions, uh, which editorial board membership is, uh, the, the proportion of Western uh, editorial board members in, is extremely high. Uh, in elite journals, there are many without uh, any editorial board members beyond mm -hmm. the United States. So it's not just 
they have full with Western uh, editorial board members, but even uh, those from these editorial members are typically came from elite uh, universities the, of the United States. And, and just like in the case of publication, a de-Westernization lip service started, but when we analyze the results, we find that uh, even those scholars who were uh, invited as editorial board members to elite uh, central journals were scholars that uh, have been educated in the West. So they are just like, um, they want to show that we have uh, scholars from Africa, from Latin America, but, but if we take a closer look, we in many cases find that these people are practically educated at the West and they are working at the West, so mm -hmm. they represent Western knowledge. Mm -hmm. Even if they are originated from uh, a world beyond the Western world, so from the periphery, from Asia, for Africa, or Latin America, or Eastern Europe, they are practically um, had uh, an education or a re-education in the Western world. On, on re-education, I mean that they have to repeat their education. So even if they have a PhD from Latin America, for uh, for example, they have to repeat their PhD in an elite uh, Britain, British or American university in order to get a position at the center, for example, like an editorial board member. Mm -hmm. And finally, my, my third area of research are the analysis of career paths of leading scholars. For example, we just finished uh, an investigation in which we analyzed the, the CVs of more than 3,000 uh, researchers in sociology. Mm -hmm. They are working at the top 100 departments of the world in sociology. And amongst these uh, more than 3,000 people, there were no one without Western education. So when we are talking about uh, academic uh, capital accumulation, we have to say that the that you have to have uh, a degree from a Western University in order to take it into ac account when they, uh, when it comes to uh, getting power positions in the field. It mm -hmm. can be uh, fellow at uh, International uh, Academic Association or editorial board members or, uh, or just uh, to have a tenure track position at any of the central universities. So uh, after this brief uh, summary of uh, my, my research fields, I, I, I have to say that they all the empirical data all supports the statements that you that you express in this manifesto and I like this text uh, so much and it will be a pleasure to work with this team because I think we have the same uh, experiences and the same goals also so it will be uh, I think it will be a very very revolutionary and, and very very successful uh, teamwork so thank you very much for letting me the chance to uh, to be part of this. Thank you, Martin. You you did a marathon in, in exactly the time frame that we gave you. So <laughs> very well done. Uh, and and uh, I couldn't agree more, I couldn't agree more with you. I, I appreciate that there is empirical evidence that you're citing uh, that actually acknowledges and, and evidence is the problem because of, there's a lot of anecdotal yeah. you know understanding that that's there is inequality but actually having that evidence base and yeah, yeah. developing that evidence base further is, is an important step i think uh we are we were considering a paper on article processing fees and how these will be affected by the plan s um, uh, initiative which is an open access initiative by Western Europe and uh, you know I think it is really important for people uh, like us to try and contribute to that evidence building that then can become perhaps a catalyst to change to see yeah, change yeah. happen absolutely well, thank you for joining us we're going to yeah. move to the next speaker but stay on the line please uh, if you can yeah. I'm quoting you on Twitter as well hopefully I'm doing a good job of okay. paraphrasing you all um, so I, uh, we should be having a Professor uh, Alex Kanimba uh, afterwards, but he's not connected yet, so I'm thinking that there might be an issue. So I'm going to introduce Professor Lutz Martin, who is already connected. Uh, Lutz, can you hear us? You're still muted. Oh, lovely. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. I can, I can. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, so it's very good timing. I'm sorry, we, we had some technical issues, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to recover from that. We're recording via different means. Um, so I'm going to do a brief introduction. Lutz is Professor of General and African Linguistics at SOAS University of London. He has conducted fieldwork in East Central and Southern Africa, 
working on Swahili, Luguru, Bemba, and other Bantu languages. Uh, he's involved in numerous funded projects uh, in linguistics, such as the Dynamic Syntax Project with colleagues at King's College London, and SOAS Project uh, on Adara, an endangered language of central Nigeria, and Herero, again, uh, spoken in Namibia. Uh, so Lutz, uh, welcome, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say and share. Ah, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, the settings. I think that's good. Um, well, I'm very excited to be to be part of this, and I've been a little bit on the peripheral, of course, being from SOAS. Mm. Um, I've been quite engaged and involved in the in the decolonizing process yes. and the decentering knowledge process. Mm. Um, and the other thing, of course, I'm really interested in is the language side. As a, as a linguist, work on African mm. languages that's very much at the forefront of a lot of what what a lot of colleagues um, in the field have been doing. Um, so when you guys started with this initiative and I, I looked at the documentation, mm. I really thought your, your take on language was very, very, very progressive and very valuable. Um, and it's something I think which, which rings with a lot of people and it's, it's great to bring, you know, bring that together. Um, so by, by, you know, what I briefly wanted to talk about today is I'm, I was curious about the relation of, of, of this project mm -hmm. uh, with wider structures and the impact it has or can have on the mainstream. Yeah. Um, and that's in part from my position a, as the mainstream, as it were, mm -hmm. um, because I've been involved in a number of, of traditional commercial journals. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to briefly look at three different examples, um, how that links with the, with the work you guys are doing, the, you feel like we are doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so so I, I want to start maybe by, by saying the way I see the project, there's five maybe key elements which to me stand out. One is the decentering of knowledge. So that's really important that there's a real geographical, you know, demographic, economic bias to knowledge. And that's something which needs to, needs to be addressed. Um, both, you know, in, in many different ways. In, in one sense, to give voice to people who don't have voices and to thoughts which don't have voices. But that's really, to me, it's, it's, just, it's just good science. So there isn't, you know, there's a political element to it, but there's also a very scientific element to it. And I think that's important. Um, the other thing which I think is really nice is the challenge of genre and, and mode so that you have um, audio and video. Mm. That's really important because, because I think, you know, I mean, as we can see here, the possibilities we now have with modern technology really allows us to go back from the written page and the linearity of written language. And, you know, there's, you know, there's other things we can do. And I think actually it's happening a lot in social media. It's happening a lot in, in culture, but less in academia. Mm. Um, and so I think to bring that in is important as well. And of course, there's reasons for that. So that your link with the peer review, I think, is interesting. So Monica, you were saying earlier that, of course, you want to also maintain excellence, you know, whatever that means. So, so there's, there's you know, complicated, uh, I think, terrains to, to travel through. Um, the other thing which is important is participation. I think you're really good at bringing people in and, you know, you know, rotating um, editorial responsibilities. Again, I'm curious to see what happens with that because I've been the editor of you know two journals and I'm involved in others, and and the, you know the balanced again. It's with the experience of doing it. So rotation, of course, is beautiful, but it also means you lose institutional knowledge. So I think that's something which would be really interesting to see how that works in practice. Yeah. Um, then open access. That's important. That does cause you mentioned Plan S just now. Open access is a real big issue at the moment. Lots of people talking about it, because that's important. It comes also, of course, from the funding councils. So lots of UK research has to be open access in a certain sense. So the publisher has been working very hard to, to try to position towards that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you know, that's something we need to push, and that's something I think which, which is going to come. You know, sooner or later, we will be fully open access, and it's just a question mm -hmm. of how we get there. What that means. Um, but then the other thing I want to come back to is language, which is, of course, close to my heart. So I think that's really important that mm -hmm. you emphasize that so much. Um, so, so what, what came to my mind, there's so many things, but you know, briefly, the, so there's linguistic complexity. So we have 7,000 languages in the world, lots of languages spoken in the global south, if you like that term. Um, but the representation of them are, is really quite poor. And there's two, as, a, as an African linguist, there's two elements of representation to me. One is which are the languages we work with, which are the communities we work with, and which of these languages get a voice in the publication, not even as a language of scientific discourse, but just as a language of being represented in the discussions we have. And then the second question is, which are the languages of academic discourse? So not all 7,000 languages, realistic, and even, even, you know, even politically, you wouldn't want to have you know, academic giant 7,000 languages, but there are languages like Swahili where you, where you do want this. And indeed, of course, that's not surprising that one of the first languages in your project is Swahili, because that's probably the, 
you know, in Turkey in Africa, that's the first language maybe what people would think of, of course, but there are others. And there's interesting work uh, by the African Academy for Languages, which is a branch of the, of the African Union, mm -hmm. working on, on continent-wide African languages. Um, the other really important thing is multilingualism, I think. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a Malaysia European, a Western European Malaysia of monolingualism, which goes back to nation state formation. Um, and, and you know the way we treat languages in schools, but the 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 the, re, the reality in the world is that people have different languages. Everybody else of us has, um, and and to bring that more into academic mainstream discourse is important. Um, translanguage is another element which are, which is a bit mm -hmm. more recent. People talk about that the notion of language is a very essentialist no, uh, uh, notion. Yeah. So well, what does it mean to be a language? And language is, is much more lived practice. And then people talk about translanguaging where people draw different repertoires. And again, that's something, it's really hard to represent that in academic discourse. Um, so I think that's a real good push to do as well. Um, and then of course, the marginalization and devalorization of, of lots of languages, African language have a long history of being devalorized. Yeah. And that, that's the colonial link, of course. And that holds true also in, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and the flip side of that is the dominance of English, which I think it's good to challenge and break. Mm -hmm. um, so what I want to look at, and I'm actually, I'm trying to share my screen. If you can't see it, it doesn't matter. I wanted to look at... Mm, I think we can see it through Zoom for us, for the ones who participate. Yeah. You share your screen, we should be able mm -hmm. to see it. If, I, if it allows me. Yeah, I think at the bottom, when you drag your mouse to the bottom, that is an icon share screen. Oh, it is. It's just slow. It doesn't matter how much if it doesn't work. It's three journals. And mm -hmm. uh, you're welcome to name them, and we. Yes, I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> we can always Google them in real time. <laughs> well, in fact, that's why I wanted to share because I want to show the. Um, I think. Bear with me. I think. Mm -hmm. it's just in a moment. I don't know why this machine is so slow. Um, I think <laughs> my machine rather... We've had it, our share of technical issues today. We sympathize. <laughs> oh, yes, it's coming. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Journal of African Languages. Look, and yes. Um, so this is the first one. This is a journal. And, you know, these are all big, you know, big publishers. Journals. So I, if you can see at the side of the screen, I can move that maybe just a little bit. Um, it says the subscription here is 214 pounds. Um, mm -hmm. so that's a real commercial issue. Um, yep. So that's something you know, which we have to negotiate. Um, but what I liked about it, so this is of course on African languages and they had just the 40th anniversary. And I've been on the editorial board for a long time. That's, that's why I promote them, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they have a little editorial which was written by the editors Felix Amek and Azeb Amha, who are both in Leiden. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they say is that on the 40th anniversary, they want to do a number of changes. One of them, um, they are inviting um, every author to optionally provide abstracts of the articles in relevant African languages for their language, in addition to the abstract in the meta language, English and French. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For some people in Ethiopia, they want Amharic, somebody Senegal and Wolof. So, so yeah. it's optional. But that I think is a good, good first step to bring other languages into, the, into this academic picture. Yes. Um, so that's one initiative which I think is right. And the second example I want to show you is JAX. Um, so this is the Journal of African yes. Culture Studies, yeah. uh, which, which you know, is a SOAS journal. It was founded at SOAS for a very long time. It's now done by the Inter Afri International African Institute. Mm -hmm. um, and that has always been very strongly focused on African languages. But there in their aims and scope, um, they are quite keen to, first of all, they say they have a special commitment Mm. Um, to Africa-based authors and to African languages. So there's a real sense mm. of you know, getting knowledge from the continent. Um, and the other thing I liked is that they say, we welcome in particular articles that show evidence of understanding, yes. of understanding life on the ground and that demonstrate local knowledge and linguistic competence. So you can see how that resonates with some of the, um, the, of the ideas you guys have. Yes. And in a sense, it's not surprising because these are both African specialist journals. So one is African language, the other is African cultures. So you'd expect that something comes from there. And the third example I want to show you, and that is in the making, but I'm keen on that. That is, it's called the Transactions of the Philologic Society. 
-hmm. And it's the oldest uh, journal dedica dedicated to the study of language still in, in production. It goes back to the 1840s. And the reason I'm keen on it is that I've just become the editor. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> no, I'm not sure it's a lot of work. So this is work. It's a big publisher. It's Wiley. So, you know, there's issues. Um, so we haven't done very much. But one thing I want to do is so, so it's nice. It's a members based John. So we have about, mm -hmm. you know, about 800 members. Um, and I want to also bring this translated abstracts into it. I, I'm almost, I'm keen mm -hmm. to make it obligatory. And I have to go through the board and see people, if people follow me. So that, you know, every every article in the journal comes with an abstract which is not in English. And French is fine, that's been, but I would like it to be linked somewhat to the language people are working on, because this is not an Africa you know, region journal at all, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it is a language journal. So I think to have a sense of multilingualism in the journal really is something which I'm keen, keen to bring in. And I've discussed it informally with a number of people, and I think there's appetite, even though you know, lots of people say, oh, it's automatic, and how do you proofread, and you know, how do you check, and there's technical things, but like you drawing on a pool of translators, given that we have these 600 or so members, I think we, we can give it a go. Um, and so that's why I thought it's the link. So this is mainstream stuff, which is far removed still from what you are doing, but it goes in the same direction. So I thought, I thought that link was really interesting. No, absolutely. And thank you for sharing. Uh, I, I'm in touch with a number of journal publishers. I always try to know what the mainstream is doing and when think, where mm -hmm. things are moving. And it's good to learn from each other. And I think we're not trying to be antagonistic. Uh, we're just trying to name the problems, right? And, and subvert them in the ways we can. We're not going to uh, ask uh, that the current public landscape disappear or change. Uh, I think most publishers are aware of the problems currently, like yourself, they're discussing solutions and approaches. And I think the step to having up multilingual abstracts is certainly helpful, I'm not denying that, but I think there is an addition, a new challenge and risk that uh, once you have a translated abstract, if you are doing an academic research or literature review, people expect you to know that work just because the abstract is available in English. So then that creates more expectations. You see what I'm saying? Because that multilingual, multilingual abstract or, 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 or option is available. But we're trying, I think we're trying a bit a step further than, than, than that. And again, not to minimize the importance of what you were discussing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in, in offering the ability to anybody in the world to uh, to write in the language they feel comfortable and own. You know, you own perhaps English or I don't know, French, or I don't know, I'm, from, I'm trying to guess. Um, just, you know, random okay. languages. But, mm -hmm. uh, but when, you know, when you are forced to speak in English, you might not own the language uh, as much. And, and also that language doesn't offer you the conduit to express, you know, what, what my, your worldview uh, or upbringing uh, uh, expresses so so it doesn't offer you that that means so we really yes we're challenged and i think uh, implementing the model will be very challenging i think the technicalities around it we're, we're discussing about them uh, we're very aware of the risks of rotating because you don't mm -hmm. just give up institutional uh, and again so this this initiative is independent of source uh, we don't want it to become institutionalized because it becomes co-opted uh, but at the same time, uh, we do need to make sure we we adhere to its decolonial purpose, right? If you give up, you, if you give it up entirely, it can be detoured, detracted from that that vision. So we do have to have that uh, influence uh, preserved, but but also allow for autonomy of creativity mm. and work. Uh, so Lutz, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, finally, uh, I, I'm going to move to our uh, last yes, speaker. Yes, we will make a video available hopefully soon. Uh, so our, our last speaker is uh, Mike Thomas. Uh, I believe Mike is now in the UK. Mike, are you there? Yep, I'm here, Romina. Can Lovely. You? you are in the UK, right? Yes, I'm in the UK. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope the public can still hear us well. So obviously they can't see you, unfortunately, currently. Um, but please speak loudly and hopefully you'll get across. Uh, Mike is postdoctoral research fellow in Ethiopian Screen Worlds on the ERC-funded project African Screen Worlds Decolonizing Film and Screen Studies uh, led by Professor Lindy Udovi at SOAS. Uh, it's a very large project, a multi-country project, which you might want to tell us about. And I think you might also want to speak on, on the importance of linguistic training in research and fieldwork, but uh, we, we welcome anything you can share with us. Thank you for being here. No, thanks for having me, Romina, and great job, you guys. Just uh, Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, the technical difficulties and everything. Yes. Um, so thanks for the introduction as well. Yeah, so I'm on this uh, postdoc uh, 
funded by the European Research Council. And the whole idea of it is to, to speak back to this mainstream film studies is our discipline. Um, but in the project, we'd, we've got lots of workshops involved in um, uh, decolonizing film mm -hmm. studies curriculum mm -hmm. in different countries, specifically in Nigeria and in Ethiopia. Um, so we organize workshops and we create partnerships with scholars and teachers, lecturers, um, industry insiders, policy makers, everything like that mm -hmm. on the ground in those countries and workshop ideas of what, what people want from syllabus, from education, what, what kind of knowledge they want to create um, and who are they create, creating this knowledge for. Um, so I think these are questions also that are very important for this journal. Um, you know, who are we speaking to? Um, it's great if you can create, create audiences in multiple languages, um, but mm -hmm. then also how do we have to address uh, and change also the translation to, to address different audiences, um, which is great with all your emphasis on the importance of translators being uh, able to understand all the nuances um, of the languages in which they're translating and again who they're speaking to. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah a bit about us so we just finished our workshop in Nigeria and we had a really great I mean actually we conducted it all through through Zoom our SOAS space contingent weren't able to travel for obvious reasons um, but again as I said all of the main uh, participants were from the country uh, where the workshop was held, which in this time, this time was Nigeria. Um, but there was this really big, uh, well, a great reaction to, to, the, to the idea of decolonizing even universities you know, in Nigeria and the film studies departments that they've established there. Um, and I mean, one thing was this idea of, yes, we need to talk about our own films from our own experiences and situate everything, which is hugely important, but it's also not to throw, throw out the baby with the bathwater and to engage with what has come before and to use, you know, you can use scholars that a lot of film studies have been based on, for example, but then you can critique them and then develop your own ideas from there as well. Um, or you can, you know, use a, a local philosopher who speaks Yoruba and, uh, and, in which you can you can critique your own worldview and and the films um, that have been developed in that context. So I guess for me, it's this idea of um, positionality, self reflexivity, always being open and engaging in whichever ways you can. If that's you know language training, then that's hugely important. But also you know there are people who can speak multiple languages, but then find like learning Amharic or or something else totally difficult to do and you know that's where building partnerships uh, having people that you can rely on communities friends networks that is really important and i think this is a really great way of 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 establishing some kind of network as well through this um through this the website that you got is very open um and again it's great because you can all you can um submit things through audio visual yeah. formats and that really open way of storytelling storytelling is is the main form of of yeah. knowledge dissemination like throughout our history right so that's, yeah. that's the most important thing um yeah so so for me i mean talking about decolonizing and my own positionality is very important in that um obviously like how did i come about to speak about decolonizing mm -hmm. i'm a london-based london-born uh scholar speaking about cinema in ethiopia like, <laughs> so it's very important for me to to also put my own positionality at the forefront of the research I do, which I would encourage a lot of people to do, and then to engage with people from that perspective. And my perspective has just been, I had the opportunity to travel to Ethiopia after I finished school. My family used to live there, so I went there for free. And I fell in love with a with an Ethiopian woman who became my wife. But in, in, in dating and everything, I, I, we went to the cinema as a natural thing for people in many, many contexts, many cultures to do, so go to the cinema. But I saw a cinema culture that was totally different from the cinema culture I was used to. Uh, I was lucky that I also studied my undergraduate at SOAS and there was Amharic mm -hmm. um, 
language course that actually got me through the whole of my undergraduate studies. Uh, I was lucky, you know, with the contacts I made there. So I, you know, this, this is my, my own privilege mm. that even enabled me to think about decolonizing. I think we have to kind of even go as far back as that, like how do we even come to talk about decolonizing? Um, but yeah, so it's, it's you know, is it, is it the chicken or the egg? What, what do we want to achieve through decolonizing? And just to make sure that all of these things are open, that we are always being self-reflective and being critical of the process, that we're not gonna recolonize through decolonizing as well. Um, but yeah, being open, being willing to understand different worldviews, different contexts, different perspectives, um, uh, respecting our own lived experiences, which is a really good thing in your um, uh, you, you posted manifesto. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So manifesto. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I hope so. The words. Uh, it's okay, Mike. Uh, I mean, you you've been amazing. Uh, listening to you, I think of the word humility having humility for us who are uh, outsiders in some way um, to, to know our limits, right? To know that we rely on uh, the communities themselves, the local spe specialists, the local people, whoever, whoever that community is, um, to learn from them and be open uh, and, and really not assume that we have the solutions or we already know. I, I think uh, all, all of us really share this idea, this understanding that that if we want to succeed with such a project, we all need to be students, right? Yeah. Come with this this uh, attitude that we're trying to learn, uh, and not with a with a preconceived plan. And it, and that's why perhaps it's frustrating to some people. Again, Monica, I'll leave Mon uh, to Monica the last the closing remark on this, uh, but. Um, you know, we leave it a bit a bit fluid currently, and for some people it might sound uncertain, but it's not. We do have a, a vision, and I think as long as you have the vision, everything will come into place uh, collaboratively as we envision it. And it's hard work; it will take more time, perhaps, but but we're willing uh, to do that because for us, it's it's about the project itself. It's not about us. We want the project to outlive us. It's not about us. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll end today's session. I'll pass uh, the last remark to Monica. Thank you, Mike. Take care. <laughs> Best regards to your spouse. Uh, and uh, thank, I thank all the participants. Uh, and I'll just pass the word to Monica to end. Uh, yeah, thank you, Romina. Um, yeah, no, there's nothing much more to add other than uh, renew our excitement and our uh, yeah, looking forward to where this project is going to take us. As Romina just mentioned, this is not about uh, us also it's about an idea that we share with all the people who are involved in this and uh, we are also ready for this idea to be molded and in fact we do invite people to criticize this project or to add or to give suggestions and so so yeah we are also curious where it's going to go where it's going to lead us and I hope you are excited as as we are and that you will keep following us and Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. We'll say goodbye now. Uh, thanks to the viewers who have uh, had the patience to keep listening despite the audio problems. Mm -hmm. We're going to try and release a good aud a quality audio recording of the full conversation. So bear with oh. us as we try to figure that out. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.